You're watching Tag TV. Hello and welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that talks about the breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. Baffer Pakistan aiding terrorists to launch attacks in Kashmir. New terror outfit All India lashkar e toiba formed by Pakistan reveals NIA India. Fighting continues in Afghanistan with grim chances of reconciliation. An Islamic state loses top leadership Baghdadi reported dead in Syria. After Indian administration has abrogated article 370 in Jammu and Kashmir enabling the indian state to receive direct benefits from the center rattle pakistan is trying hard to whip up havoc and violence through continuous terror attacks in kashmir the region has witnessed three terror attacks in only last week causing huge casualties and turmoil in the valley we have a report in a bid to create unrest in the valley pakistan backed terrorist group launched a grenade attack at a bus stop near a busy market in support town of North Kashmir's Baramulla district injuring at least 20 civilians it was the second grenade attack in 3 days after six members of india's security forces were injured in shrinagar recently the attack took place a day before the visit of a delegation of european union mps in the valley as a failed endeavor to muster international support against the indian government's decision to revoke article 370 pakistan will not stop these actions under any circumstances till such time we punish him and punish him extremely hard because if they stop pushing in infiltrators the kashmir narrative is lost after article 370 has been abrogated and 35 has been taken taken off there are only about 200 to 300 militants in the valley who have are running short of ammunition they are running short of weapons and pakistan is in a desperate situation trying to beef them up otherwise once the winter set in even those people will be eliminated and 99% we will be able to establish full peace and tranquility which pakistan doesn't want want to happen scrapping of the temporary special status of jammu and kashmir has badly rattled pakistan which is desperately trying to draw international attention on the issue by launching terror attacks in kashmir with the help of terrorist groups pakistan occupied kashmir has become the hub of terror launch pads terrorists in these launch pads are always on the lookout to infiltrate into kashmir which is facilitated by pakistan army's constant unprovoked ceasefire violations continuing with its malicious agenda pakistan border action team last week launched rounds of ceasefire violations in order to help terrorists cross the loc having lost its security personnel and civilians in the firing by pakistan the indian army launched its retaliatory action by dismantling terror launch pads in the pok's neelam valley pakistan is actually converted pok into a terrorist rule state or province there's so many terrorist training camps all over pok and there are almost about 58 launch pads with 500 terrorists wanting to ingress into india at any point of time the local government virtually is non existent it is the terrorists who calling uh, ruling the roost under the circumstances pok including gilgit and baltistan has become a totally terrorist sponsored and terrorist ruled province baffled by india's counter terrorism attack five migrant workers were brutally killed by armed terrorists suspected to be associated with Pakistan based terrorist organization Jaish e Mohammed in Kashmir's Kulgam district as an attempt to create environment of fear and panic among civilians earlier this week in another brutal attack three migrant laborers were killed by terrorist in Shopian and Pulwama districts with such vicious attempts Pakistan is trying to hinder the economy and progress in Kashmir by threatening people 
who try to reopen their business or otherwise return to normal life in Kashmir, hoping to maintain a crisis state with the intention to gather the attention of international community. Well, Kashmir is still unsettled after more than two and a half months. There is something going on there by which migrant workers, that means they want to ruin the economy or the progress in Kashmir. No money, no shopping. No shopping, no life. Therefore, that is what seems to be happening. While the situation in Jammu and Kashmir is returning back to normalcy, Pak's sponsored terror outfits are using every trick in the book to incite civil unrest in the region. Such consistent attempts of Pakistan at fomenting trouble and breaching harmony in an otherwise peaceful Kashmir reek of its duplicity. In a bid to evade mounting global pressure, Pakistan has reportedly launched a new terror outfit to carry out attacks in India. According to Indian government sources, the new outfit has been named as All India lashkar e -Toyba which seems more like a simple rechristening of the existing infamous lashkar e -Toyba. We have a report. Sources from Indian intelligence agency reveal that Pakistan has created a new terror group to carry out its terror activities in India. The new outfit's existence came into knowledge of Indian intelligence agencies after a hit list was sent to the office of the National Investigation Agency recently. The revelation comes amid reports of global terrorist Hafiz Said, co-founder of Lashkar-e Taiba and the chief of Jamaat ud Dawa, running the terror empire from Pakistan's Kot Lakhpat Rai jail. The whole focus of Lashkar-e Taiba has been India, and therefore creating a new organization is just trying to uh, give a message that they are now very serious. They previously also they used to create problem. It doesn't matter, and uh, we don't have to get unduly perturbed. Only thing we have to ensure that we have to watch the activities of uh, this new organization of Lashkar Toba and how do they how do they progress? That monitoring has to be done, and we should now uh, try to uh, finish off this in the bud itself, so that before this flower tries to bloom, we should we should get rid of this uh, this new organization of Lashkar Toba. Indian intelligence agency has also received a letter in which dreaded terror group All India Lashkar e Taiba, sponsored by Pakistan, has named famous Indian personalities on their hit list. The hit list includes several prominent Indian names such as Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi, President Ramnath Kovind, Union Home Minister Amit Shah, and Indian cricket team captain Virat Kohli, among others. The All India Lashkar e Taiba is believed to be working under the direct commands of Hafiz Said, who is currently enjoying a comfortable stay in a Lahore jail. According to a report, the Mumbai attack mastermind is running the affairs of his band Jamaat ud Dawa group from Lahore's court Lakhpat jail. The US Department of Treasury has designated Said as a specially designated global terrorist and has offered a 10 million US dollar reward for information that brings Said to justice. This is another form of psychological warfare which Laskre Tawa is trying to do. It is trying to draw mileage or exert pressure on the Pakistan government that whatever little initiative Pakistan government is trying uh, and trying to impress FATF, Financial Action Task Force, that also should cease. cease. So therefore, this is just a propaganda approach of Laskre Tawa. Islamabad is under immense global pressure to act against terrorists operating from its soil. Earlier this month, Paris-based Financial Action Task Force has put Islamabad on notice, warning that the country will be blacklisted if it does not control terror funding by February next year. The FATF voiced serious concerns over Pakistan's failure to deliver on most of its 27 targets. The International Terror Financing Watchdog warning means that it would be difficult for Pakistan to get financial aid from the IMF, the World Bank, Asian Development Bank and the European Union. Moving on, in spite of multi-pronged efforts by the most powerful countries across the world to restore peace in war on Afghanistan, the Taliban have been relentless in their attacks on civil and security installations. Few weeks back, they stepped up their offensive in a bid to sabotage presidential elections, 
flustered by the failure, they further intensified their violence. Now they are killing more people with impunity. The security personnel who are supposed to be protecting civilian walls are dying in dozens. The situation is worsening every day and there seems no light at the end of this precarious tunnel, a report. Afghanistan is more violent and more unsafe today. With Taliban rapidly gaining control over large swaths of territory, the peace looks unobtainable in near future. Some call it impossible. A hope popped out when the insurgents and the United States were on the cusp of hammering out a deal that would have given the relative relief to civilians. But all was dashed in a moment when President Donald Trump decided to put a plug on the process. Although diplomatic channels have tried to resume the negotiations, nothing tangible has been achieved so far, with situation only becoming more complex. Pakistan-backed terrorist organizations have proliferated and so have the attacks. Multiple casualties are documented every day. The situation in uh, Afghanistan is in a flux. Basically, America wants to leave Afghanistan. They are in a hurry. And this message has gone across to all the terrorist groups. So therefore, they want that whatever is the next system in that they should be predominant and prominent. And that is why there is a tussle going on between the various terrorist groups there and the sufferers of the people, killings are on the rise. Taliban which once agreed to talk with the U.S., but then the U.S. later refused to talk with them, are now asserting themselves again. And the worst part is that Pakistan, despite all the censor from America and from international community, continues to support Taliban and the Haqqani network, which are the main terrorist groups. Teasing and challenging the establishment of Afghanistan, the Taliban regularly updates its social media accounts by giving a detailed story of terror and horror. Only two days back, the Taliban insurgents stormed the security checkpoint in northern Afghanistan's Gunduz province, killing more than a dozen and injuring several others. And this is not a one-off incident but a routine exercise of terrorists. And it is not just Taliban, but different organizations have been bombing different parts of the country. Last week, more than 60 people were killed in a brutal attack on a mosque in the province, and more than 100 were wounded. No one claimed responsibility for that attack. Peace process hasn't made a move ever since it was called off by the U.S. president. Peace process has to begin. But peace process has to involve all stakeholders. Nothing can be done by leaving one party and favoring the other. As long as all stakeholders are brought together and they agree to a consensus and a common uh, program, I think peace cannot be ensured in Afghanistan. Peace process must begin and all stakeholders must be brought on the same platform. Nine rounds of talks were held between the United States and the Taliban. Even a draft agreement which sought a gradual departure of U.S. forces from Afghanistan against Taliban not providing safe havens to Al-Qaeda terrorists was prepared. However, in the end, no results were yielded. Daft Russian diplomacy also tried to control the situation through other means but has failed to create any impact thus far. A 60-strong delegation of Afghans, including government officials and representatives of civil society groups, held a second round of intra-Afghan talks with the Taliban in July in Qatar. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the elusive chief of Islamic State, met his final destination this week in a U.S.-led counter-terrorism operation in Syria. The chief of the so-called Islamic State was announced dead on October 27th by the American president himself. The killing of Baghdadi has brought setback to terror lords sitting in Pakistan as a large part of the Islamic State's operation in South Asia is being carried out under the Islamic State of Khorasan, which falls in the Pakistan-Afghanistan region. 
In a major blow to Islamic State's terror kingdom, the U.S. Special Force killed its chief Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi this week. United States President Donald Trump announced Baghdadi's death on 27th October in a press conference. In his announcement, Trump said Baghdadi detonated his suicide vest when trapped in a tunnel while trying to escape with his three children. Adding to his statement, the U.S. President informed that the test results, which included DNA confirmation, were totally positive. Last night, the United States brought the world's number one terrorist leader to justice. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi is dead. He was the founder and leader of ISIS, the most ruthless and violent terror organization anywhere in the world. The United States has been searching for Baghdadi for many years. Capturing or killing Baghdadi has been the top national security priority of my administration. U.S. Special Operations Forces executed a dangerous and daring nighttime raid in northwestern Syria and accomplished their mission in grand style. The U.S. personnel were incredible. I got to watch much of it. No personnel were lost in the operation, while a large number of Baghdadi's fighters and companions were killed with him. He died after running into a dead-end tunnel, whimpering and crying and screaming all the way. Experts suggest that the killing of Islamic State leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi in a U.S. raid is further blow to a jihadist group that once held a swathe of territory in Iraq and Syria. However, the organization and its ideology remain dangerous. Where once they confronted armies, the extremist Islamist group's adherents have in recent years staged hit and run and suicide attacks. In some cases, the group has claimed responsibilities of atrocities such as bombings in Sri Lanka in April that killed more than 250 people. The U.S. Special Forces carried out, uh, carried out an operation in which al-Baghdadi was killed and he was the supreme leader of ISIS. Uh, how violent he was and how he was responsible for killing of thousands of innocents is well documented. So therefore, his killing by U.S. Special Forces definitely is a very big blow as far as ISIS is concerned. Presently, ISIS itself is in big retreat. However, it is not finished completely. What is interesting that Baghdadi was a threat not only to the U.S., but also to all the varying factions in Syria and Iraq. In fact, the Russians, the Syrians, the Kurds all uh, uh, helped the U.S. Special Forces to carry out this raid. So therefore, it is very well understood that ISIS was a threat to the peace for the whole world. So his killing is a good news. Islamic State in Khurasan, which took its name from a historical region that covered much of modern-day Afghanistan and Pakistan, appeared in late 2014 in the eastern province of Nangarhar, where it retains a stronghold. It announced its formation in January 2015. The group's leadership has pledged allegiance to Baghdadi, and it has claimed attacks on civilians target in cities including Kabul. In its recent activity in South Asia, the Islamic State claimed the Easter Sunday bomb attacks on churches and hotels in April and released a video showing eight men declaring loyalty to Baghdadi. Experts suggest that the killing of Baghdadi will bring an end to the so-called caliphate that the ISIS and its offshoots were fighting for. This is the end of the caliphate. Uh, secondly, you know, we have seen in the past whenever the chief or the uh, dies, you know, normally the split take place in the organization because uh, uh, they don't have second man in command. So these commander, they fight among themselves. So there is a possibility, you know, further is possibility of a splitting the ISS. And uh, thirdly, you know, as it is, uh, it has weakened and um, 
under pressure from Syria, uh, Iraq, both the countries, you know, governments are looking after them. Apart from them, America, Russia, uh, Turkey, as well as uh, Kurds, you know, they are playing a very important role in containing this movement. Mm, but uh, ideology is still there and large number of militants are still hiding in different places. So threat remains there. Baghdadi had long been sought by the United States as head of the ISIS, who led the jihadist group since 2010, when it was still an underground offshoot of Al-Qaeda, a Pakistan-Afghanistan-based terror group in Iraq. In Syria and Iraq, Baghdadi had declared a caliphate under the banner of its group ISIS. Islamic State has carried out atrocities against religious minorities and attacks on five continents in the name of a version of an ultra-fanatic Islam that horrified mainstream Muslims. The United States had put up a $25 million reward for the capture of Baghdadi. Terrorists who oppress and murder innocent people should never sleep soundly knowing that we will completely destroy them. These savage monsters will not escape their fate, and they will not escape the final judgment of God. Baghdadi has been on the run for many years, long before I took office. But at my direction, as Commander-in-Chief of the United States, we obliterated his caliphate 100 percent in March of this year. Today's events are another reminder that we will continue to pursue the remaining ISIS terrorists to their brutal end. Sources say that the killing of Islamic State leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi over the weekend was spurred by members of his own inner circle and intelligence gathered by conflicting sites in Syria's multifaceted war. Baghdadi's death was captured in a video that was released soon after the end of the raid led by U.S. Special Forces. Easter Sunday bombings in Sri Lanka and increasing Islamic State attacks in Afghanistan point towards Islamic State's rapid expansion mission in South Asia. Baghdadi's death has also brought a jolt to the group's leadership, but in South Asia, the Islamic State can still continue to enjoy support of the terror-sponsoring nation, which is none other than Pakistan. We are now joined by Mr. Dipankar Sen Gupta, an international affair expert from India, to speak more on this issue. Mr. Dipankar, could you please tell us about Pakistan's role in helping ISIS establish its presence in South Asia? You have to understand that ISIS largely is a mentality. It stems from a particular mentality. That is a very regressive form of religious fundamentalism. Religious fundamentalism itself is regressive. This is a very rabid strain of that particular fundamentalism which gives growth to ISIS and adherence of ISIS. It is this fundamentalism that the Pakistani state has been pushing, promoting, financing, facilitating for a long period of time now. Certainly since 1977-1979, uh, during the Afghan, during and after the Afghan Jihad. It is the infrastructure that they have built, which breeds militancy, which builds, builds intolerance, which uh, uh, targets even adherents of the same faith with whom you do not agree on some minor points. It is that infrastructure, it is that milieu that creates or helps to support the ISIS. Do you think Baghdadi's death could be an end to the Islamic State's presence in South Asia and other parts of the world? I have a feeling Baghdadi's death will not affect the ISIS popularity in uh, South Asia. One is this particular infrastructure that has been created and this infrastructure is largely a virtual infrastructure which takes the help of the uh, uh, World Wide Web and social media. That mentality, unfortunately, is still alive. So Baghdadi's death will make him a martyr, possibly in the Levant or in West Asia. 
uh, there may be some setbacks, but given the fact that the Turkish state uh, has undertaken policies which seek to undermine the enemies of ISIS rather than the ISIS itself, I am not too sure whether the ISIS will be weakened in West Asia also. But I have a feeling that as long as the infrastructure of terror exists, the soft infrastructure to peddle hatred in the name of religion exists, ISIS as a movement, ISIS as a mentality is going to remain with us for quite some time. Thank you, Mr. Sengupta. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We will be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Surbhi Sharma signing off on the behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care. You're watching Tag TV.